Uh, well, welcome everybody to our first meeting of the Cohere for AI ML for Social Good speaker series. Uh, we are very excited to welcome different speakers who can actually tell us how they're using machine learning algorithms, artificial intelligence, whatever you want to call it, to do, do something good for this world. And uh, yeah, so hi everyone. I'm quite excited about the start uh, of our sub series, uh, subfield, and we're going to start with. Um, sorry, how sh should I pronounce your name correctly, just so I know? Jorge, yeah. Jorge, yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, he's going to tell us about a quite exciting project uh, about the disappearances committed in Mexico and um, what algorithm they used in order to help to find people more effectively. Um, so I will get it over to Orge and please. Yes, thank you. Let me start by uh, sharing my screen. Um, OK, so first, uh, let me start um, by thanking uh, Cohere for AI, uh, Kate and Jen for inviting me to this session and to these talks on the uses of machine learning for social good. Uh, I'm really happy to be here, and I'm really happy to be sharing the work that we have been doing uh, several organizations since 2017 to support the search uh, for the missing or persons that have been disappeared in Mexico. Uh, so this is the, the, yeah, this is what I'm gonna be talking about. This is the name of my presentation. And here is a brief uh, outline of what I'm gonna be talking today. And please, yeah, uh, feel free to send all your questions, comments, and, and let me know. Uh, so first, um, I'm gonna start by talking about the context of disappearances in Mexico and why did we start uh, with the, why did we start with this project and what is the relevance of uh, using these technologies to support the search for the missing. Uh, after this, I'm gonna get more into the technical part of how our spatial model works, especially the one that we have been um, developing uh, to predict the location of hidden graves or clandestine graves in one of the regions in Mexico, in the northwest region of Mexico, in the state of Baja California. Uh, after this, I'm going to talk about our recent results and how this model has been deployed uh, in the field and how it has also been acknowledged by some international organizations. And lastly, I'm going to proceed with some of uh, of our possible next steps and how do, how we want to keep uh, moving forward uh, with the use of this model and these technologies. So first of all, why are we using these technologies, right? Why, why are we developing these technological tools? Why are we using statistics, uh, machine learning, uh, remote sensing? So first of all, it is important to have a little bit of uh, concepts of the phenomenon. Uh, so usually when we're talking about uh, uh, disappearances, we're on this, we're understanding them as complex uh, constructs that might have different scenarios or uh, yeah, different uh, possibilities of why a person goes missing. So usually when a person go, goes missing, we want to differentiate between cases that are violence related and non-violence related. So for example, when a person goes missing, due to a, a, an event that it's not violent, it can be related to, for example, a natural disaster, right? So people go missing in natural disasters and we need uh, to see how we deploy technologies to find them. However, there are other cases uh, where persons go missing uh, due to violent reasons. And that is that persons are deprived of, against their liberty. Um, and usually these are, uh, uh, yeah, these are, these, are, these are known as disappearances uh, in international human rights law, in international criminal law, in, uh, in international humanitarian law. When a case is related to violence, they are known as disappearances and they are usually referred as enforced disappearances or involuntary disappearances. So these are disappearances that are committed, for example, by state actors, by state armed actors, but also non-state actors such as criminal organizations. So it is important to have this or, or to understand these differences in, in concepts because our work usually focuses on the sec on on the cases related to disappearances uh, 
that were committed with violence, right? So those are the ones that we are focusing on. And these are, those are the ones uh, that are, our work is trying to uh, bring analysis and possible um, solutions. So in Mexico, unfortunately, disappearances are not new. Um, in Mexico, we have had three periods of disappearances in the country. The first one started during the late 1960s until the early 1980s in the period known as Guerra Sucia or the Dirty War. And these were cases of disappearances that, that were committed by authorities or state actors during the authoritarian rule uh, in Mexico. And, and these disappearances were committed against uh, political activists or persons who were perceived as political dissidents um, by the state. And these were disappearances that were very focused in specific regions of the country, especially on the southwest of the country in states like uh, Guerrero, for example. After this, we had a second period of disappearances in the country uh, during the uh, early 1990s, in the period that is known as the low intensity conflict. And these were also disappearances that were committed by authorities toward political dissidents, uh, also in focalized regions, for example, in the south of the country. However, this period of disappearances is important to highlight because not only disappearances were being committed by authorities, but also, for example, paramilitary groups were involved uh, uh, in the disappearances. So uh, the involvement of factors began uh, to be more complex in this second period. And now the third period of disappearances and violence started during uh, the late 2006. And it's, it's a period of violence and disappearances that we're still experiencing. And it's the period of the so-called um, war on drugs. So the war on drugs started as uh, a federal strategy to use military personnel, to use police, uh, to counter drug-related activities in the country. So this, so this decision by uh, the federal authorities created a, a spiral of violence. And one of the consequences that we're seeing is in the number or the rise of disappearances that we have seen uh, in the country since 2006. And this is specifically the period where our research is focusing. There are other researchers and work being done to locate the whereabouts or to conduct investigations from uh, the dirty war or, or the low intensity conflict. However, it is important to stress that our work is only focusing on this late period from 2006 and onwards. <clears throat> so what has, what has happened since 2006, we started seeing an increment in the number of disappearances uh, reported. So this, brought, this started to bring international attention uh, to the country, right? So for example, in 2009, we started having uh reports and documents from international organizations for example human rights watch uh presented a report on cases of disappearances reported in the north of mexico and then we had also the visit from the united nations working group on enforced disappearances or involuntary disappearances which is uh, a special procedure so it's a group of experts uh that conduct visits uh to countries on specific themes so the working group uh from the un was able to talk uh, with families of missing persons in the country to document cases of related to disappearances. And this first visit in 2009 from the working group was important because they established that, in fact, disappearances were being committed uh, in the country. And it was also important because they highlighted that disappearances were not only being committed by organized crime, as it was mentioned, for example, in the public sphere, but they also mentioned that disappearances were also being committed by state actors. So for example, military or police personnel. So this, was, this visit was important because this is what civil society, uh, NGOs and groups of family, families with missing persons were advocating, right? They were saying like, it is important to recognize that this is uh, now a public problem. And, and it is important to recognize that not only uh, organized crime is, being, is involved in the disappearances, but also state actors. After this, we started to get uh, uh, yeah, supervision or, or reports also from different bodies from the UN. So for example, the Committee on Enforced Disappearances also started to pay attention to the issue. And on, in 2015, uh, they, they presented a report uh, that was important 
also for the Mexican context, highlighting what I have here in the slides. Uh, and it was important that the, the committee mentioned that the phenomenon uh, was a widespread phenomenon, meaning that disappearances were not are not focalized on a specific region. Uh, rather, that the committee mentioned that uh, disappearances are committed in the majority of the states uh, of Mexico. That's what they mean uh, with a widespread uh, phenomenon. So this was also important to recognize the magnitude uh, or the context that we are experiencing right now with disappearances. And after this, after 2015, the Committee on Enforced Disappearances reinstated uh, in 2018 and in 2021 that Mexico is still going through a widespread crisis of disappearances um, in the country. So just to give uh, a little bit of context, currently, this is the figure that we have of persons that are reported as missing or disappeared uh by the authorities or, or by official data sets uh, more than 100,000 disappearances are reported and it's important to mention that from these 100,000 cases more than 90 percent of the cases have been documented after 2006 after the war on drugs um, started in, in the country so within this context uh we start uh the phenomenon uh, on disappearances started to get more attention in the public sphere, right? Uh, in the public debates. And groups of families with missing persons, with persons that have been uh, disappeared, and NGOs and universities started to bring uh, more debate uh, uh, towards authorities, right? They started to stress that, okay, we need to implement public policies uh, to attend this public problem. We need to start uh, criminal proceedings against uh, possible perpetrators of the crimes. So during several years from 2014 until 2017, there was a, an important discussion to how to create, for example, a general law uh, against enforced disappearances and disappearances committed by non-state actors. So by 2017, this general law was approved and it, and it was an important step towards acknowledging uh, the problem and to start implementing national and local policies regarding not only the criminal investigations or the prosecutions towards people who are responsible of committing disappearances, but also in developing programs to search and identify the persons that have gone uh, missing or that have been disappeared. So for example, the general law uh, creates a national search system that is in charge of looking for the disappeared and also foresees uh, the creation of a national search program and a national exhumations program uh, in, in the 32 states of the country. So it is within this framework uh, that our work um, try, that, that our work tries to support, right? We try to develop uh, statistical methods, statistical analysis, technologies to support the implementation of the programs contemplated in the General Act against the Forced Disappearances in Mexico. However, we also try to support citizen-led initiatives uh, of brigades that are also conducting uh, search uh, for missing persons. And it's something that I'm going to highlight a little later as well uh, during the presentation. But uh, what, is, what, is, what is important for us in developing these technologies is to provide clues of knowing where to search, right? We need to know uh, where the persons that have been disappeared are, and, and we need to provide uh, some evidence for this. And, we would like to stress that these models, uh, they are looking, uh, they're sp pinpointing specific possible locations of clandestine graves. However, uh, this is just a part of the search for the missing people. We would like to stress that there's also initiatives for looking for the people while, while they are alive, uh, which is also very important. However, our work just focuses on a specific part of the search uh, towards the missing and the disappeared. So keeping in mind uh, that context, now I'm going to specify how our spatial model works, uh, how we have been acquiring the data and how we have been analyzing it and using different layers of information uh, to start uh, this model. It, so it, it is a spatial model to predict the location of clandestine graves or hidden graves in one specific region of the country, which is Baja California in the Northwest region. This is uh, a project that uh, yeah, has several organizations involved. 
all of these organizations, we have been working since late 2017 to start implementing technologies to support uh, the search of the missing. So uh, these organizations, Data Civica, Elementa, Centro Geo, Universidad Iberoamericana, and the Human Rights um, Data Analysis Group, uh, we all have different roles towards, uh, for example, developing the technical aspects of the models, but also working with groups of families with missing persons and sharing our results and, and uh, on finding or understanding possible ways on how to implement the results uh, in the field. So it is important uh, to highlight that this is not a, um, a work of only one organization. All of these organizations have been involved and they have all been providing uh, amazing work and expertise towards developing um, these technologies. So let's start now to understand how our model works, right? And where is Baja California and why are we doing this? So we started working with this project or developing this specific model um, to identify clandestine graves in Baja California in late, in mid 2021. Although we have been developing other models to locate uh, clandestine graves in different states of Mexico. We started with this specific one in 2021 because we were able to acquire more detailed information uh, about the phenomenon, specifically on the, on the clandestine graves or the hidden graves that have been found uh, by authorities. So during uh, 2021, uh, Elementa started doing, uh, conducting freedom of information requests, requests towards the Attorney General Office, asking for information about clandestine graves uh, in the state of Baja California, where those where have uh, these clandestine graves been found? How many how many bodies have uh, been recovered from the clandestine graves? That is bodies of victims that were disappeared, and then they were um, uh, there. There was a ho also a homicide, and there, then the bodies were disposed uh, in these graves, right? So. Uh, with this information, we uh, we were able to get uh, 160 points of clandestine graves that have been found in the state. That is 160 points that have the coordinates or the specific location of where the clandestine grave uh, was found. So by using these 160 points, that's how we knew that we were able to develop some specific uh, spatial statistics and some specific spatial analysis to pinpoint locations uh, where to find possible new clandestine graves based on what we know or the, or the distribution of the points that ha that were um, provided by the Fiscalia or the, or the Attorney General from Baja California. And we decided to do this with a combination of spatial statistics and also hyperspectral imaging. There have been other approaches in also in other countries using different tools. However, we believe that this is a good approximation, especially because it's rather easy to implement and rather easy to replicate as well. And we are trying to use uh, open source software uh, that's that allows people to replicate the model in, in other contexts, right? So in the map, you can see where Baja California is located. It has an approximate area of 71,000 square kilometers. So it is a big region in the country. So we, we need to try to find how we can delimit the, the, the possible search areas of, of possible new clandestine graves, right? So that's our goal. Uh, and that's why we, we decided to develop uh, this spatial model. A quick note before diving into the technical aspects on how our uh, model works. We would like to highlight, or, or it's important for us to discuss what are the possible data limitations or what are the possible data biases uh, that we have right and um, why it's important to consider this because usually when we're working with human rights data or with violence related data we need to understand that this violent that this data sorry is usually um, uh, they are usually convenient samples so what does this mean this means that uh, the lists for example or the data that are provided by authorities by NGOs by international organizations documenting the phenomenon it's not necessarily representing the whole population of either disappearances or for example clandestine graves or homicides right there are specific economic geographical political factors that constrain the possibilities of one institution on capturing or documenting the whole phenomenon 
So this is important because we, we, we would like to highlight or to stress that our data is, has possible biases, right? We're only using one source of information, which comes from the local attorney's office from Baja California. So this doesn't mean that the 160 points uh, of clandestine graves that they were able to give us uh, is necessarily the whole clandestine graves that have been found in the region, right? Maybe there are other sources that have also documented uh, clandestine graves or hidden graves in the area. So for example, journalists or groups of families with missing persons and NGOs also, also working in the field, they might have uh, data that at the moment we don't have. So we had to model um, the information using only one data source. So it is important to highlight that when we're using disappearances data or clandestine graves data or human rights data, we're not necessarily modeling the pattern of disappearances or clandestine graves findings in the region or in the country. Instead, what we are doing is we are modeling the social production of information of disappearances uh, or clandestine graves. So what is the capacity that we have to observe uh, the phenomenon? So this is a this is different, right? This is this provides an epistemo epistemological challenge. Um, we have to be aware of the of the biases, but that's why we also use statistics, right? Even though if our data is incomplete or has possible biases, statistics also allows us to overcome these biases. First, by acknowledging and knowing how to prepare our models, parameters, uh, and inputs. Um, so yeah, this is just something that we always like uh, to highlight it's for us it is always important to understand what are the systematic differences between the observed data and the data that has not been observed uh, especially when we are uh, analyzing such a an important uh, yeah sensitive topic uh, as disappearances and clandestine graves findings so with that said now i'm going to specify how our model works how our, our model to locate hidden graves uh, works and what what is what it's important to know is that uh, our model is a combination or a superposition of three geographical layers so first we start with uh, developing some spatial statistics uh, with point pattern analysis and we what we try to do is to try to understand the distribution of the points that were provided by 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 the, the by the local attorney's office so where are the the where have the clandestine graves been located uh, is there like a random pattern between the points or, or are they clusters um, of specific uh, locations of, of the graves? Uh, so first of all, it's, it's important to understand how this distribution of, of the points is. Then uh, our second layer of information or, or our second layer um, of input for our model is what we call clandestine space. And it's a combination of uh, accessibility and visibility analysis that I'm going to specify more how it works uh, later. And the third layer uh, that uh, we use for our model is we try to identify concentrations of nitrogen uh, in the ground. And I'm also going to uh, specify why do we care about nitrogen concentrations in the field. And this third layer, this is, uh, we're able to do this nitrogen concentration analysis with hyperspectral imaging or with remote sensing using satellite imagery that is available uh, to the public. So I'm going to start, uh, uh, yeah, specifying how each of the layers uh, work and how uh, each of the data analysis work and how by the end we will have a model that has these, these three sources or these models as an input to try to reduce the search areas that of, of Baja California. Uh, I just want to highlight again that our goal is to delimit possible search areas to try to reduce the amount of possible search areas in Baja California and try to identify regions that are likely to have clandestine graves based on what we have seen from the previous discovered graves, right? So first of all, uh, our first layer we start we start by doing spatial statistics. Uh, what is important for us to do with this first layer of information or with this layer, with this first uh, statistical approach is to try to find what is the distribution of the points. And especially for us, it is important to understand if the clandestine graves show a random distribution or if there is clustering uh, of the points, if there's a specific areas or regions where the clandestine graves are being found. And based on the map, you can 
by a first look, you can start to see that there's an apparent clustering, right? Like you can see that the points are uh, conglomerated on specific uh, sites of the state. They appear not to be random or dispersed uh, throughout the whole region. But we can prove this uh, with statistics and doing uh, specific statistical tests uh, to test this. So we first uh, start doing uh, uh, a statistical test called average nearest neighbors. So what uh, average nearest neighbors, neighbors do is uh, it indicates uh, how the dispersion of clustering uh, of the points are in a specific region. So it's a, a global clustering test that tells us if the if the points are randomly dispersed or or if they are clustered. So with this test, it is a it, it is a global uh, rate ratio, right? Uh, what uh, average nearest neighbors is doing is a global test. We're not specific. We're not specifying uh, specific groups of clusters, rather uh, a, a global distribution of of the clustering. And it is important to start doing this test, the specific the, the average nearest neighbor, to find if there is clustering or not of of the points. So. Uh, by starting with, with this uh, statistical test, we did find that there is clustering of the points of clandestine graves that have been found. This, this makes sense. And um, it is, uh, if we analyze it, for example, this means that perpetrators of people who are responsible of committing disappearances um, and clandestine graves, they tend to find or they, they tend to look uh, for specific places to commit these crimes, right? It's not like uh, every place in Baja California is suitable to commit a disappearance or to um, uh, or to do a, a clandestine graves, a clandestine grave. Rather, they look for specific places uh, where they could commit uh, these crimes. So we're also modeling the spatial behavior of uh, of perpetrators, right, and victims. And what we have found, so for example, if, if the points were randomly distributed, the mean. Uh, distance between points will be of 12.72 of kilometers. However, since there is clustering, the mean distance between the points is 4.8 kilometers. So this means that, in fact, the points uh, are, uh, are, are, significant, are statistically significant, uh, and there's a conglomeration in the points. After this, after uh, so we, it is important to do the average nearest neighbor test because if we find that there is clustering of the points, then we can start to do a different statistical test to also try to do inference on the points and to find more specific distributions of the points. So after doing uh, or or after implementing uh, the average neighbor nearest neighbor test, we start we started to implement other spatial statistics. Uh, models uh, that allow us to uh, identify more of, of the specific distributions, but also to try to do inference uh, on the points. And what, what do I mean with this? So after doing um, the average nearest neighbor test, we, start, uh, we started doing uh, other two statistical tests using a dbscan algorithm and the replay cave function. What the dbscan algorithm does is that it creates natural groups of clusters of the points. So as you can see in the map, uh, we have four natural groups of clusters of the points from clandestine graves that have been found, right? So uh, this is important because then we can start to um, pinpoint more specific um, locations of where the clandestine graves have been found. And then we can start to implement the replay cave function um, uh, to, to our model. So what the replay cave function does, it's also a statistical test to acknowledge if there is conglomeration uh, uh, of the points, but it, al it, also allows, uh, it also allows us to do uh, inference on the points. So what uh, replay, case, replay K test function does, it's, uh, it identifies the clustering, but within specific distances that we uh, specify to the, to the model. So for example, it, 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 it starts to identify if there is clustering, I don't know, between 100 meters, 200 meters, 300 meters, 500 meters, one kilometers, two kilometers. So it, it identifies how significant is the clustering, but based on distances, not only on a global ratio uh, uh, as, as ANN yeah. tests does. So this is very useful because replay cave function allows us to uh, specify or to understand the probability of where could new clandestine graves be found based on the points that we have um, 
located previously. So for example, if, if we go into Baja California and we stand in one of the places where a clandestine grave has been found, using the replay cave function, we can start, uh, we believe, we, yeah, we can start to identify possible new distances. So what replay cave function is doing, it is telling us that if we stand in one of the points where a clandestine grave has been found previously, it is highly probable that we can find new clandestine graves between 21 to 43 kilometers around uh, the distance from that specific uh, point. So that's why replay K allows us to do inference because it allows us to highlight or to find possible new distances of clandestine graves based on the pattern of the distribution of the points that we have uh, right now. So this is why replay K function is uh, useful. And this is why this first analysis of the point pattern uh, distribution is useful because based on where the points are located, we can then start to do uh, or to or to highlight specific places where we could find more graves uh, within distance of, of meters and kilometers based on what we have seen um, previously. This is why we need to do first the point pattern analysis, because if there is no clustering, then we cannot start uh, doing um, the, the next approaches that I'm going to highlight. So this is uh, this is how our first layer works. And after doing this, and after implementing this first uh, spatial statistics, this first uh, spatial analysis, we then move into uh, start to start developing our second layer of information or our second layer for our model. So our second layer is what we call the clandestine space layer. And here, what we're doing is we are modeling, we're using, for example, environmental criminology theories and work to try to model how perpetrators and victims uh, move spatially, right? How we try to model the behavior of perpetrators and victims uh, through a spatial lens. So what we believe for what we hypothesize uh, with this special, with this uh, clandestine space layer is that perpetrators in, in the region in Baja California, they will not uh, commit a disappearance or they will not, uh, uh, yeah, do a clandestine grave um, in all the in all the areas, right? Rather, they t they tend to find places where they that might be easy to access by car, or they tend to find places that are private in terms of visibility. That means that uh, if they commit these crimes or if they start doing a clandestine graves, it is it is not highly possible that they will be uh, found, right? Or that authorities will uh, will know that they are committing these crimes. So there is a rational act in committing the disappearances and there's a rational act uh, on how they are finding these clandestine spaces, right? So these, these, these clandestine spaces uh, can be modeled or it can be done. Um, we can do st special statistics as well to try to identify uh, what we call as clandestine space. So what is the clandestine space? Um, we, we created in, in the region, the whole region of Baja California, uh, we created uh, spatial grids to try to model, for example, how accessible by car these areas in Baja California are and how visible they are within kilometers from the roads. So what we call clandestine space, it's a combination of places that are highly accessible by car. And by this, we model, for example, uh, the travel time from urban settlements to another specific place of, of, of the region in minutes. So it is how accessible these places are by, by car within the, the, the main urban settlements from the region and how visible they are uh, from the main roads. So for example, if we stand uh, in one specific uh, place of Baja California, what the visibility layer does is how far we can see in terms of uh, distance in kilometers, right? So if, if for example, uh, if we stand in a specific place in Baja California, what we are doing, we are modeling how far we can see and we are not blocked, for example, by trees, by other type of vegetation, by hills, etc. So what we believe is that, uh, or what or our hypothesis is, is that perpetrators tend to find places that are not completely visible or that there's less percentage of visibility, but that they, that they are easy to access by car, right? Because perpetrators, they don't want to be moving a lot of of resources, they don't want to use a lot of time committing these crimes. So for example, they don't want to move, for example, more than one hour uh, 
by committing these cards, uh, these these crimes from the main urban settlements. They tend to, to find places to commit these crimes within 30 minutes of urban settlements or between 20 minutes, right? So what we have found is that using uh, the 160 uh, points from clandestine graves, 144 from the 160 points that we have uh, from the authorities were located in these areas where there is a low visibility, there is a low vis visibility budget, but that they are highly accessible uh, by cars. So this is what we call the clandestine space, right? So clandestine graves are usually located in places uh, where it's where is difficult to look to the horizon, but where the perpetrator has an, ex an easy access to the place in terms of distance uh, by car. And what we have found also is that 17% of the territory in Baja California has this characteristic of the clandestine space. This means that 17% of the territory in Baja California is highly accessible by car, but it's it, it has also low percentage uh, percentages of visibility uh, within kilometers from the main roads uh, in Baja California. So this is how our, our second layer work. And what, what we did is first, um, uh, when we ident identify the possible distances of new clandestine graves based on the point pattern analysis, and then by superimposing this second layer of clandestine space, we were already able to reduce a lot of the potential search uh, areas uh, in Baja California. However, we decided to also include another third layer uh, of information. And this third layer of information is where we're using, where we're, where we're using hyperspectral imaging or satellite images. And what we're trying to do with this third layer of information is try to identify the nitrogen concentration in the ground. So you might be asking, what is the relationship between the nitrogen concentration in the ground with clandestine graves, right? So uh, our colleagues from Centro Geo, they have been developing or they have been conducting controlled experiments uh, in different regions in Mexico, simulating clandestine graves for example with uh with uh, with bodies of pigs so what we have seen or what they have seen uh, during these experiments is th that during the decomposition of of the body nitrogen is released uh, uh in, into the ground right and there's an anomaly of the of the nitrogen concentration in this in these specific areas where the where the graves are simulated so what we believe is that um these concentrations of nitrogen or these anomalies of nitrogen in the ground could also be an indication that clandestine graves uh, might be located uh, in the region or in the place. So by using this um, index, which is called the red edge chlorophyll index, we can identify the anomalies of nitrogen concentration uh, in the ground and possibly analyze uh, that place to see if in fact it looks like a place where there, where there is a, a clandestine grave. And these anomalies of concentration of nitrogen concentration are looked as in time series. So, for example, there would be outliers, right, of random or not normal uh, peaks within the time series of the nitrogen concentration. So, if there is th this anomaly of nitrogen concentration, we believe that it, those places should also be looked because possibly uh, a, a clandestine grave uh, was done there or a crime was committed there. And this nit nitrogen concentration layer, we do it using uh, Sentinel-2 satellite imagery, which is freely available satellite imagery that provides different resolutions of data within 10 meters to 60 meters of high resolution in the ground. So these are just these are all uh, satellite images that are available to the public and that have been uh, proven to be effective uh, for us to develop this third uh, layer of information. So now, after mentioning um, the technical side of our work, I'm going to highlight what are the results and the impact uh, of our model. So by combining these three layers of information that I just mentioned, by identifying the distribution of the points and possible new distances, by combining uh, the places where there is high uh, accessibility by car but low visibility, and by, and by identifying the concentrations of nitrogen in the ground, by combining this, those three layers, we can potentially reduce the search areas or the whole region by more than 80% in Baja California, which is uh, already a good um, start. It, it is already uh, a good reduction of the area because as we have seen, Baja, Baja California is a rather large state um, in the country. So 
with our model, we were able to reduce these potential search areas by more than 80%. And we wanted to provide this information not only to authorities, but also to citizen-led initiatives uh, or citizen or groups of families with missing persons that are conducting search strategies in the region, right? So what has happened is that, unfortunately, the states, uh, well, the authorities are not necessarily conducting, have not been conducting, for example, search brigades or search strategies because of lack of resources, but also lack of political will. And sometimes as disappearances are committed as well by authorities, they don't want to be looking for their own crimes, right? So what has happened is that also groups of families with, mis with missing persons are starting to take their own initiatives and started uh, to conduct their own research and investigations and started to conduct their own searches in the field uh, to look for these potential grave sites. So in Baja California, there, ha there has been three citizen-led search brigades uh, where they go through different municipalities of the region to try to locate uh, these hidden graves or these clandestine graves. So the last, the last citizen brigade that was uh, conducted in Baja California was in April of 2023 of last year. And we were able to provide uh, information to this uh, search brigade of potential sites where they should be looking for clandestine graves. They shared the information with us of where they were, were of where they were trying to look or where they were, they were trying to focus on the brigade. So what we did is that we provided polygons with information of places where we believe that clandestine graves could be found based on our model's input. And what happened is that uh, during this search brigade in April of 2023, 2023 two clandestine graves uh, were found by the brigade using our results. So this, is, this shows that our model could potentially be used uh, in the ground. We are already started to see results uh, in the field. And what we would like to do is to continue using this uh, this tool in the in in in, in possible new uh, brigades that will be conducted uh, in the state as well. So this is how we have been using our model in the field, and our results have also been acknowledged by different uh, groups and international organizations. So, for example, the United Nations Working Group on Enforced Disappearances or Involuntary Disappearances uh, prepared a thematic report on new technologies and enforced disappearances. This was a thematic report that was prepared for more over than a year by the working group because they are acknowledging that technologies have now a role in the investigations and the search of the missing in different contexts and in different countries, right? So throughout a, a year of consulting with experts and organizations uh, and governments on how these technologies have been employed, the working group was able to receive information from our model and our approach and in and and in the in the report the working group uh stated this right that our, our methodology is bringing encouraging results and is worth uh further consideration and, uh, and analysis so we believe that this is, this is also a good impact of our model and how it is potentially being recognized uh as a tool to support the search uh for the missing so now just uh to finish and to start with the q a these are, these are our possible next steps or what we want to do uh, with our model and with our uh, technologies and with our methods, right? We, first of all, we would like to try to keep on reducing the potential search areas, uh, not, not only in Baja California, but in other regions. So we're experimenting with new approaches, for example, maybe using more also machine learning, for example, spatial random forests models or spatial or uh, uh, other algorithms, for example, as MaxEnt, which have been used in countries such as Colombia. Um, so we would try to keep on reducing uh, the search areas with new approaches using statistics and machine learning, but also by conducting in-depth interviews, uh, for example, with families of, with missing persons, but also with authorities, because this would provide it will provide us more contextual information of how disappearances are being committed in the state and how clandestine graves are being found uh, in the state. And we can use this information as more input uh, uh, for our model, right? Our second um, uh, next step is that we would like to obtain more information of your reference points, right? So because 
what we have now is only one source of information coming from authorities but there's also more information coming for example from press sources or groups of families with missing persons so we would like to we would try to also include this information as well uh, to our model to try to delimit more of the search areas and know more of the distribution uh, of the clandestine graves our third step is to generate more context studies of the dynamics and patterns of disappearances and our fourth uh, next step is try to replicate this methodology not only in Baja California but in other states uh, of the country as well right now we, are, we now have for example information in the state of Michoacán we are trying to have information in Estado de Mexico which is a neighbor state of, uh, of, of Mexico City so we believe that this methodology, that these uh, methods can be replicated in other states where disappearances have been committed. So that's what uh, our aim is gonna be. We will try to replicate this uh, method uh, to use it um, in other states. So that's what we will be focusing on in the next months and in the next years. And yeah, with that, uh, that's that's all from my side thank you uh if you want to have access to the slides uh, of these presentations you can scan the qr code that it's here in in my slide and i also included here additional resources if you want to learn more or to read more of, about our approach so for example in the first uh url that is here it's a, a url of the citizen evidence lab from amnesty international this is where we have been publishing our results from our models since uh, 2022. And you can also find other resources on how technologies are being used uh, to document human rights violations. Also, if you want to have a more technical um, uh, description of how our model works, the second URL is uh, the scientific paper of our model. And also the third URL is a recently published working paper um, where we're trying to uh, yeah, provide like a contextual history of how these models and methods have been deployed in different contexts. It is a field that we have labeled as database disappearances analysis. So if you are also interested in knowing more of the methods and methodologies um, employed not only in Mexico, but in other contexts and other countries, I invite you also to read uh, that last paper. And yeah, uh, Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to your comments and questions. Thank you very much, uh, Jorge, for a wonderful talk. Uh, maybe, um, oh, we have two questions. Uh, let's see, uh, Valeria, can you ask your question? Yes, uh, hello, Jorge. Congratulations on your presentation uh, and on your project. Very interesting. Uh, and if there is an opportunity for, for example, for me to join it and to participate, I would be interested. Um, I am also interested in pursuing a master's uh, at, as the one that you are, I don't know if you already finished, but the one that you did at Oxford uh, seems very interesting, social data science. But uh, my question is actually about uh, data, the data that you guys use for uh, fitting the, the models. Uh, because as far as I understood, it is more like open source data, right? Uh, and I was wondering if your team has explored uh, if you guys could use, the, like make some partnerships with some uh, organizations in Mexico that use AI or data or do monitoring for uh, environmental pur purposes. Because I've seen that there is like, uh, it's an area that has been growing a lot and I was wondering if uh, that type of data uh, could maybe be shared through a partnership with the organization and then like uh, provide more useful insights for you guys or for the models. Yes, uh, thank you. Should I, uh, uh, sh should we collect uh, different questions or should, uh, should I start uh, with this one? Um, no, please answer. Okay, yes. Well, thank you Valeria for your uh, uh, question yeah right now it's mostly using open data either coming from conducting the freedom of information requests to authorities we have also gathered data coming for example from press sources or also from groups of families with missing people but yeah uh, to be honest we haven't explored these uh possibilities that you mentioned like m making partnerships uh with maybe other organizations uh, um, documenting uh, this other information, for example, in, for environmental purposes. We would like to actually, uh, because uh, as 
spatial modeling and these type of methods they rely on different cultural environmental and political information right so definitely by incorporating another source of information such as the one that you're mentioning could potentially also allow us to understand more of the context and uh some of it why of some of the distribution of the points or try to make hypotheses on uh the criminal behavior of uh of the perpetrators right um so yeah that's definitely something uh that we would like to include uh right now uh we haven't been actually in talks with these types of of, of groups but if you have ideas <laughs> if if you have possible uh yeah yeah a, a proposal we, i would love to talk about that and yeah um Thank you again for, for these, for your comments on the questions. Thank you. I think Kushal has a question as well. Uh, yeah. Yeah, first of all, thanks, Ore, for this great, amazing presentation. I would say like I really learned a lot, particularly how statistics can be used for such an interesting problem. Uh, I had actually two questions. One is related to, uh, I would say, scientific stuff that uh, when you were actually mentioning about level one, level two, and level three layers. So, is it like the input is basically growing going to uh, level one then whatever the output comes it goes to level two and then level three or is it, is it like you are doing a weight uh, or let's say assemble of level one two and three models and then trying to get some output and if it or uh, and also have you tried doing some other i would say settings doing assemble to tweaking with layers uh and my second question would be on uh uh, on very higher level related to this particular problem statement that although you are uh, uh, currently working on Mexico, but what do you feel that if you moving forward, uh, let's say, try to work on more global level with other countries? So what do you think that which layer could be like a little bit challenging? Because with each country, I would say some things would change. Let's say well, the insight which you shared about nitrogen, it is like quite interesting. I, wa I wasn't aware. So uh, could it be a case that in some uh, a country which have a lot of interest industrialization, this particular layer could uh, give some wrong results? So like, what are your insights about that as well? Thanks. Yes, uh, thank you for your question, um, Kushal. So if, if I understood the first part is uh, you're asking uh, if we do layer one, then we move to layer two. And if we don't have, uh, uh, yeah. how are we combining these three layers, right? Um, so yeah, in overall, like each layer is uh, an ind independent step of analysis if you want to, to look at it. Um, the first layer uh, is the most important for us at the beginning because it tells us about the spatial distribution of the points. So uh, what uh it's important for us to identify with the with the first spatial layer is it is if, if there is clustering of the points or, or not because if there is not if there is not clustering then it's more difficult to start implementing um other hypotheses or other statistical tests because uh, it's more difficult mo more difficult to model a random distribution right of the points However, if, if there is clustering, then we can start to do hypotheses or questions, right? Like, okay, why are these, why, why are the points um, conglomerated in specific areas? Does this tell us about uh, the patterns of the perpetrators and how they behave? But does this also tell us maybe about the capacities that authorities have on finding um, these clandestine graves, right? Uh, but but yeah, the special layer, the first one is is important uh, for that, and also to identify pot potential um, distances of new uh, clandestine graves based on the points. However, um, uh, this this is this is a layer that can be just uh, be conducted uh, separately, right? And in fact, other studies, for example, in in former Yugoslavia, have relied on these um, methods only using this this first layer. Uh, but we decided to combine it also with the second and the third layer because this first layer uh, it's very it's helpful to delimit potential search areas around but it doesn't pinpoint a specific uh, location right uh, it doesn't tell us okay between 20 or 40 kilometers we need to find how to move uh, on this radius right but we're not still um, uh, signaling or identifying a specific uh, place within uh, this distance so by combining the second layer, the spatial uh, accessibility and visibility, we can start to reduce more of these uh, radius uh, 
radius or circles of distances that we had with the first layer. And with the nitrogen uh, concentration uh, layer, it's also a layer that we use when we are analyzing potential search areas based on information that it's, it's being provided by us, uh, for example, by this citizen-led citizen uh, search brigade. So yeah, like if, if you want, or you can say that these, the, the three spatial layers are independent, but when we join them together, that's when we're actually able to reduce a lot of the potential uh, search areas. Like uh, each each layer could be used uh, independently, but we believe that uh, when we combine them, it's that uh, when our model is um, is working the best, uh, or we're providing more information to potential search areas. And related to the second question, that, that that's uh, that's a really interesting uh, question, and it's a good one. Uh, so, for example, as I mentioned, the first layer, the first uh, the point pattern analysis of of the clandestine graves. In fact, this is an, an approach that we replicated from studies that were conducted um, previously, for example, in former Yugoslavia. So we knew that we were able to replicate uh, those studies in Mexico if we had this specific type of data that we needed. Specifically, we needed the coordinates uh, of the points. That was that's what's most what's the, that's the most important thing for us. Uh, in doing this type of uh, approaches, having the, the coordinates of the point and knowing that they are uh, the correct uh, coordinates, right? Because they, they might be also coordinates that are not uh, showing or documenting the specific place. So we also had to conduct the uh, verification of each of the points to see if they actually made sense with the description that the, the authorities um, provided. Um, so I guess, yeah, by maybe replicating this approach in other contexts, in other areas, it depends on things. Uh, it depends on the quality of the information that you have. For example, the quality of the information that is being provided on clandestine graves. But if you have those points, then you can start to replicate maybe the first layer. The second layer, it's also easy to replicate in terms of modeling. However, we will also have to see if this hypothesis or this uh, notion of clandestine space works uh, in other contexts, right? What we have seen is that perpetrators in this specific area in Baja California, they tend to look for these places where there's high visibility, so, sorry, high, high accessibility by car and low visibility um, from the area. But maybe in other contexts, in other countries, the concept of clandestine space may not work. We would have to see um, specifically on that in that place. And regarding the third layer, uh, the nitrogen concentration, yes, in fact, uh, it, it will depend right on when, where we're trying to analyze the nitrogen concentration. It also depends on a, a lot of factors. So for example, if we're trying to see or, or if we're trying to look for graves with longer periods of time, so for example, 10 years, 15 years uh, uh, previous of, of previous years, maybe the nitrogen concentration will actually not work because we need uh, like uh, newer new uh, grave sites uh, to detect this because of the of the decomposition of the bodies, right? So it will depend on the time frame or the investigations that we're conducting. But also, as you mentioned, as you mentioned, yeah. The, uh, what is the terrain <laughs> that we are actually analyzing, right? So maybe nitrogen will not work in specific areas or work better in other specific areas. But yeah, um, I think uh, that's the question that we have. Uh, we believe that these methods could be replicated. However, there are other approaches that are also being um, implemented or other groups um, are trying to do, for example, in Colombia, in Argentina, uh, in Guatemala, for example. And this is also what we have uh, been studying and what I mentioned in the last paper of the, the review that we have done on different statistical techniques um, uh, to do this. So yeah, I guess uh, it's a pretty new field. Um, we're seeing good results, but we still have to test a lot, right? Uh, but that's uh, also the interesting part of this field um, right now, so. So yeah, thank you for your, your question. Um, I think we're a little bit over time, so let's...
thank you very much for the talk. Um, really appreciate it. Certainly, we learned a lot. Uh, we'll have it up on YouTube in the next few days. And yeah. Um, thanks, everybody, for attending. Yeah. yeah. Thank, thank you. you, everyone, for uh, attending, and thank you for the talk. I saw that you just recently published the paper, so congratulations on that. Thank you. Yeah. yeah no, and, right. and thank you for the invitation. Right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.